Good evening, everyone. Um, I've spoken in a few places, but I think it's always hard to speak hardest when you know people and when you're at home. I'm in Derry next week and in Enniskillen, but uh, Cora mentioned nerves. I think the hardest few words I ever had to say was last May. I had to say I do to this woman here. I got married. <laughs> I took, I took, it took me over 50 years, but I, I got there. It's very hard to follow from the, the mix of speakers we've had, and uh, I, I find the night that hybrid of ideas, there's all sorts of ideas floating around, and I think it's really good. Uh, Flash spoke about creating a space where people can co-work and co-live, but, but a space where people can co-share ideas. That I think ideas are the genesis to transformation and to change, and uh, the world, whilst we're more connected than ever before, needs to connect to a new frequency, I think. It needs to connect to new ideas that uh, we, we get reminders every day, no more so than today in Christchurch in New Zealand, where you realize that there are dangerous ideas floating around, there's dangerous ideologies out there, and we need to strip language back to the core essentials, and I suppose that's a little bit of what I'd be saying. Sometimes music can say things that words can't, and that's my theme tonight. Um, uh, I love music, I play the guitar, I'm normally hiding behind the guitar, uh, but, um, and I feel it then when I have the guitar, when I'm in front. I don't mind introducing anything when I have a guitar beside me. I sort of hide behind it and the guitar speaks. Um, so bear with me until I sort of get my own even keel as well. Um, life is funny. You can be cruising along at low altitude and in an instant everything can change. Uh, I found that in various ways over the years. You, you, you feel you're in a comfortable space, something happens that you didn't see coming, and you're rooted another way that you never anticipated and you're not prepared for. And one such event happened to me a few years ago. I was in business in Gorey in Wexford. Um, I was on the rebound from something, very, a difficult patch in my life where I was really knocked to my knees and I was just getting back up again. And I had this idea of creating a cinema in Gorey, and I put a big investment into it. Uh, we got the cinema up and built, and just at the time when the cinema was about to open, the crash came. I had to, ultimately, without boring you with the details, I had to sell back the cinema to the bank. I had to sell the site, which I had a development plan to do a leisure complex all around it. I had to sell the site back to the bank, and I had a house in Arkeen Village here in Waterford, and I lost that three years ago. So in an instant, Everything that once defined me was stripped away, and it was just me. And I found it very hard to get out of bed for a few months, to be honest. I used to stay up late, get up late, and at times I, I was looking at myself in the mirror and nearly saying, Phil, your mid-40s, is this it? Is this where it ends? And I had to sort of find something within. I had to connect to something inside myself, because all that once defined me was gone. And I unearthed something that's in all of us, a sort of reservoir of strength. I don't know where it came from, it's not me. It's something that's in all of us. There's a spark within us that when we go through tough times, we can connect to. And we find something that just helps us wade through to the other side. We don't cruise through. We, we don't, some days we don't really quite understand what's projecting us forward. But we connect to something deeper. And it's that deeper that I'm just going to speak about for a little while because music has helped me to connect to that deeper in a way that maybe language hasn't. And on World Speech Day, it's music I want to speak about because language has its limitations. And that deeper dimension maybe goes beyond the parameters of language. Uh, I think it's the Indian mystic Tagore who said, I spent my life stringing and unstringing my instrument when the song I came to sing remains unsung. So I spent my life running around after everything, stringing and unstringing my guitar, while the song I came to sing remains unsung. And in many ways, that was me. I was running around, I used to teach, I'd be flying from one class to the next. I was on autopilot. But when the crash came in my life, it forced me with it into myself. And the place I used to go to was the Donnerail out in Tremor. And there I used to look across the bay, and this wasn't like me at all, because I never had time. In my 13 years teaching in Waterford, I never once was on the Donnerail. But here I was, with my business gone, with my teaching career gone, stripped down to the core essentials, looking out at the bay from the Donnerail over to Brownstown Head. I could see the three towers with the metal man on one side, Brownstown Head's two towers, and I could anticipate what was around the corner, 
hook. And I, I used to sit on a bench there and just look out and just try and gather myself. And as I gathered myself, I looked at the water and there's something reassuring about the sea. Every day, regardless of whether the tide was in or out, regardless of how tempestuous it was, or how choppy the waters were, the tide came in and it went back. The waves came in and went back. And over, over time, a sort of reassurance seeped into me that there's some sort of plan to this, there's some sort of uniformity to this, there's something universal beyond us that we can connect to. And the closer you are to nature, the closer you get to this that we are not on our own, that there's something wider. And over the years then, through music, I began to connect to these things. And I just want to share three short experiences where I went with the choir. Uh, as Cora mentioned, I'm musical director and founder of the Island of Ireland Peace Choir. It was formed 21 years ago this year, after the bombing in Oma. It was inspired by a girl who was standing beside the car where the bomb was planted who lost her sight that day and never had, it, uh, never had it restored since. And eight years later, having got to know Claire very well, she asked me to do the music for her wedding. I got a group together from Waterford and from Oma, and we nailed it. And that night, over a fair few drinks, I gave my word that I'd keep the choir going. We were drunk singing Danny Boy in four or five part army. <laughs> and it's dangerous to things you commit to when you have a few drinks in you. Uh, but I committed to keeping the journey of the choir going. Claire asked, and she's a hard one to refuse. That girl that was once a 15-year-old girl is now in her mid-30s. She has a husband and three children. She's recently been nominated Tyrone Business Person of the Year. She's opened her own music academy in Oma. And she is testimony to what I'm speaking about here, that there's something deeper within all of us that we can connect to. Two years ago, the choir went to Auschwitz. And you, you know that you don't need me to replay, but I'm going to recall different experiences, like a, a snapshot of a series of little reels on a film that connect up. Auschwitz, we were on the platform in Birkenau. We had an interpreter telling us, here on this very platform, X amount of years ago, the trains used to come in in two daily shuttles, about two and a half thousand people in each, each, each set. And the people would be sort of spewed onto the platform and the ironic thing that struck me, we were there with the choir, was that a band was playing, an orchestra was playing. And I began, this didn't sit right with me at all. There was a strange sort of juxtaposition of opposites. You had music and you had death. You had light and you had darkness. You had sort of mellowed tones and piercing cries, all side by side. And I, just for an instant, as the, the voices in the distance went away, and I began, to, I heard this thing that there were 140 people in this carriage, like sheep in a cattle grid or whatever, and they were just spewed out. And we sang there, and we sang a U2 song called um, uh, Sleep, Sleep Tonight. What was the name of it again? Sleep, sleep tonight, and may your dreams be realized. If the thundercloud passes rain, so let it rain, rain down on me. Mm -hmm. So let it be. We sang that in harmony. Now, it, it wasn't brilliant musically because we were beyond words. But in ways, it allowed us to articulate something that was inexpressible, something beyond language. Ten years previous to that, I was in a church in Matara in southern Sri Lanka with the choir. A couple of years previous to that, the tsunami had struck the coast. And in this church we were in, it was Our Lady of Matara's church. In, it was just about 200 miles south of Colombo, the capital. And on the morning of the tsunami, which was, you'll remember, it was 2004, St. Stephen's Day, the, the priest was saying Mass, and he looked out, the back doors of the church were open, and he saw this wave coming. And he knew it wasn't subsiding, and he knew the closer it got, it was getting larger. And he appealed to the people, the congregation in front of him, don't come with me, we'd climb up the attic, he'd never seen anything like it. Some fled feeling and believing that the more inland they went, the safer they'd be. They all perished. 
And those who went with him got up in the attic. Uh, I think they all survived. But in his church that day, 29 people died, from children as young as four to adults as old as 84. So a couple of years later, we were there in this very church. And we were beneath a giant crucifix. And the people and the priest told us a story before we sang our song. And he said that all that was left of the crucifix were the two arms. And it was, they were, it was as though that the source of everything had not fully deserted them. That they weren't alone. That despite everything they'd been through. And when we sang, there were Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, all in this one building. And we, we sang this song called Still, and the, the chorus went, When the thunders rise, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. And the people told us that within a few hours of the tsunami, they, sh they buried their own dead. The barriers went. The barricades went. The Muslims and Christians and Hindu, they buried their dead. They fed each other. They clothed each other. They gave homes to each other. The divides that are so apparent went. So when we sang that song there, there was a real sense that maybe we need to get back to our shared humanity. Maybe, maybe civilization has drifted on a, on a stratosphere that it has become estranged from where it really belongs. Maybe we need to connect to something deeper. And the last little story with the choir was uh, Christmas 2014. We visited Messine, uh, the place where the famous Christmas peace truce happened on the battlefields of Messine. Now in 1914, picture the scene on Christmas Eve, the soldiers were fighting, there were Belgian, Irish and French and English on one side, the German on the other. And that year the Germans were given Christmas trees just in advance of it. And they had them, there was this sort of halo of light going the whole way down the trenches on the German side. Small trees with lights. And when you looked over, all you could see was this sort of prism of light going the whole way down. And one tenor was moved by this, one soldier, sorry, and he was German, and he, st he started to sing Steel and Oct. And things got silent, and on the other side of the trenches, they could hear this sound echoing across no man's land. And all of a sudden, some of the soldiers got out of the trenches, and on the other side, they got out. And as you know, they met halfway. They played football. They shared brandy. They shared wine. They showed each other's photographs. This is my child. This is my mother. This is my sister. This is my brother. And that moment, it's as though something timeless spilt out onto the battlefield, something that we shouldn't forget. And when we visited there in 2014, the highlight wasn't so much the cemeteries and the graves that we visited. We were deeply moved and touched by that. It was a woman that lived beside the field where they, used, where they played the football match. And her name was Mary Trace, and she was 88 years of age when we visited. And she came out of her house to us as she does for all visitors with tea, coffee, cakes and sandwiches. And her belief is that if people have bothered to travel here to remember what happened here, I owe it to them to look after them. And Mary Trades was amazing. She had no word of English, but the music sort of bridged things. And we sang Danny Boy for her. It's a, a regular that we can pull out, uh, but it, it was just lovely and it's a universal song and she recognised it. And that year we were given um, crystal from here in the city and we were given a scroll from the mayor and we were meant to give it to the dignitaries. But that night at the concert, we changed tack last minute and we just called up Mary Trace. The, the, the mayor and those weren't too impressed, but we gave it to her because we felt that she embodied everything that matters. That her kindness, her smile, her warmth, her, she was connected. She was the embodiment of everything that matters. So just to wrap up, music so has brought me to places that I couldn't have imagined. It has sustained me through good times and through dark times. It has helped me to connect to that one thing within me that gives me the strength to keep going. And we all need to connect to that from time to time. I think it was George Bernard Shaw who said, life is no brief candle. It's a splendid torch that we've got hold of for a moment before we pass it on to the next generation. And I, I'm a firm believer that we all have a song to sing and uh, make sure you sing yours just as I'm trying to sing mine. Thank you. Yeah.